Hello dear friends, now no one is surprised by a bicycle, let's find out what people thought about this vehicle in the past. Before the creation of the today's modern bicycle, there were several examples of simpler bicycle transport devices. It all started in 16th century with the discovery of 1,493 Leonardo da Vinci's sketches, which included simple designs for bicycle. Some historians claim that either his student giant Giacomo Caprati made this drawing, or that is altogether fake. That design was never produced into working model and in following 400 years horses remain only affordable means of transport on public road. The German Baron Karl von Dries invented precursor to the modern bicycle during early 19th century. This velocipede named Lofmaskine consisted of two wheels that were held together with one central bar. Driver of that vehicle had to walk and run to gather the needed speed and then raise his legs and continue to cruise until his momentum faded. Design of Von Dries was improved in England with the commercially successful Danny Horse. That design remained in use for almost 40 years until two French carriage makers came to idea that would revolutionize the bicycle world. Pierre McCox and Pierre Lallemand saw how Danny Horse is used and they devised the plan to attach the pedals to the front wheel and install the driving seat on the support beam. In 1864, they made their first model that proved to be very efficient and easy to produce. Four years later, they gathered the funds for mass production and begun improving their initial design into what will become known as Bone Shaker. Bicycle frame were made from iron instead of wood, and soon they started including rubber tires and ball bearings. One of the most popular designs of that time was bicycle model with larger front wheel. Created in 1869 by the Frenchman Eugene Mayer and mass produced by Englishman James Starley, high wheel bicycle improved several aspects of its use more comfortable than Bone Shaker higher speeds and lighter frame but it added few disadvantages difficult downhill and uphill riding. First high wheel models become available during 1870s in England, where they were received in good light. After those first few years of high wheel bicycle popularity, in 1885 Englishman John Kemp Starley created his first safety bicycle. Today that invention is regarded as one of the most important moments in bicycle history. It had featured chain that connected pedals to the rear wheel and steerable front wheel. This device called Rover ignited the era known today as Golden Age of Bicycles. Since that time, bicycle design and equipment became standardized across the world and they satisfied all four basic aspects safety, speed, comfort and steering. They all had the basic diamond shape made from metal, pneumatic rubber tires, roller chain, one gear, coaster brakes and more. Golden Age of Bicycles lasted from 19s to 1950s in which bicycles became one of the primary means of public road transportation. Early bicycle clubs popularized recreational driving across America and Europe. During the years their manufacturing costs came down significantly, which increased their use all over the world. Modern Age of Bicycles started in the 1960s and 70s with the increase of North American consciousness of the benefits of exercise and energy-efficient transport. In 1975, over 17 million riders started driving a new sort of much lighter and cheaper bikes. Since then racing bikes, mountain bikes and BMX became the standard for the bicycle drivers all around the world, with a recent addition of hybrid commuter bikes specialized for city use with wide range of equipment taken from mountain and speed bicycles. Standard materials from which modern bicycle frames are made is aluminum and carbon fiber. In 2010, Worldwide production of bicycles is in the range of 125 to 130 billion. On a May day in 1884, Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, took a break from riding in his Hartford home to do something that, at 48 years old, he had never done before, ride a bicycle. Twain wrote about mounting the four-foot-tall penny-farthing bike for the first time and of subsequently flying over the handlebars and landing in the hospital and taming the bicycle, an essay published seven years after his death in 1910. Despite the difficulties Twain faced on his inaugural ride, the author ended the piece by encouraging readers to buy a two-wheeler for themselves. You will not regret it if you live, he wrote. In New York City, where a cycling boom was underway, several thousand riders pedaled through the city's streets, according to Evan Friss, author of On Bicycles, a 200-year history of cycling in New York City. But the undercurrent of uncertainty in Twain's command about whether mounting a bike meant risking one's life was increasingly a concern in New York. In 1880, officials voted to ban bicycles and tricycles from the city's parks in a bid to protect pedestrians from what parks commissioners said were the threats posed by peddlers. The belief that cyclists endanger other New Yorkers persists among some, 
but bikers are overwhelmingly victims of collisions rather than the perpetrators of them. Only one cyclist has killed a pedestrian since 2017, according to Gothamist, and 10 cyclists have died on New York City streets so far this year, double the amount killed by this time last year, according to a police department spokeswoman, Sergeant Jessica McRory. Sergeant McRory couldn't immediately say how many cyclists had killed pedestrians in recent years. The complex past, present and future roles of the bicycle as a vehicle for both social progress and strife are explored in Cycling in the City, a 200-year history, an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York through Oc. 6. With more than 150 objects, including 14 bicycles and vintage cycling apparel, the exhibition traces the transformation of cycling's significance from a form of democratized transportation that gave women immigrants and minorities a sense of freedom beginning when the first bike arrived in New York City in 1819, to a political football that continues to pit the city's more than 800,000 cyclists against their detractors today. Mr. Friss, an associate professor of history at James Madison University who organized the exhibition with Donald Albrecht, a curator at the museum, said, the bicycle can be used as a symbol for change, for invaders coming into a neighborhood, for shaking things up. Here are some of the exhibition's themes. The biking boom in late 19th century New York offered the mainly white, upper-middle-class women who could afford to buy them a way to eschew the stringent Victorian-era expectations of true womanhood. They instead became new women who challenged gendered norms by using bicycles to claim space on the streets and control over their own lives. The suffragists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were among the women who championed cycling as a path to freedom for women, with Anthony telling the journalist Nellie Bly in an 1896 interview that it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. Outside feminist circles, traditionalists charged that the 20% of New York women who missed her first estimates wrote would append society as they knew it, and 1895 print in the exhibition shows a posse of new women entirely reliant on their two wheels, cycling to do laundry run errands and visit the graves of their dead husbands. But pioneering female cyclists insisted that such a reality wouldn't be so bad. Violet Ward of Staten Island started a bike club for women with her friend, the renowned photographer Alice Austin, and wrote Bicycling for Ladies, a 200-page book advising women on how to become serious cyclists. White women weren't the only New Yorkers using bicycles to assert the validity of their identities in public space. Immigrants and minorities formed predominantly male cycling clubs of their own at the turn of the 20th century. They served two functions, to promote ethnic pride and solidarity, but at the same time, to promote their American identity, because the bicycle fad was sweeping the nation, Mr. Friss said. German, Italian, Japanese, Chinese, Danish, Mexican and Mongolian immigrants created their own riding groups, and black cyclists formed the Alpha Wheelman to counter the idea that the new national pastime was only for privileged white men. Marshall Taylor, known as Major, was a member of the South Brooklyn Wheelman Club and gained national fame as the first African-American cyclist to become a world champion and only the second black athlete to win the title in any sport. The Canadian boxer George Dixon was the first. Cycling has also dredged up heated and deep-seated debates about who deserves space on New York streets. It's fascinating the degree to which the bicycle is a politically charged object, in the way in which politicians use it and the kind of animus it creates, and the way it becomes a symbol for all sorts of other political debates about who belongs where, Mr. Chris said. A short film, A Winter with Delivery Workers, directed by Jing Wang delves into one of the more recent disputes between Mayor Bill de Blasio and the many immigrant delivery workers who rely on throttle-assisted electric bicycles, known as e-bikes, to do their jobs. A clip from the film shows Mr. de Blasio praising police officers in October 2017 for confiscating more than 900 e-bikes so far that year a more than 170% increase from the previous year. We have to go after anyone who creates a threat to neighborhood residents, Mr. de Blasio says in the film. The mayor later announced a plan to clarify the city's vague law that bans motorized scooters and explicitly allow pedal-assisted e-bikes, which typically do not exceed speeds of 20 miles per hour. But a package of bills proposed in the city council that would also legalize electric scooters and throttle-assisted e-bikes remains in limbo. Subscribe to the channel and evaluate the video in the comments, as well as other interesting videos on the channel. Good luck!